Good morning. I think it's still morning. And thank you for your patience. I'm Councilmember Adrian Adams. Welcome to this meeting of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Sightings, and Dispositions. I'm joined today by Council Members Traeger, Koo, Barron, Miller, Ayala, Levin, and Koslowitz. There will be no public hearings today. Today, we will only be voting on items heard at previous meetings, as all public hearings are now closed. Audience members, we welcome you as always to this meeting, but if you've come to disrupt, you will be removed immediately. We will vote to approve LU 545, an application submitted by HPD for an amendment to the Blake Hendricks Affordable Home Ownership NIHOP Urban Development Area Project previously approved by Council Re Resolution 1263 of 2017. The amendment would allow HPD to forgive all or portion of the land debt to reduce the taxable consideration of the home. The application relates to a cluster of properties in Council Member Barron's district in Brooklyn. We will also vote to approve LUs 546, 547, and the pre-considered LU for HPD application number 2025-11 HAM, all related to the NME 11 West 140th and West 150th Street UDAP, approving HPD's acquisition of property located at 207 through 209 West 140th Street and 304 through 308 West 150th Street, the designation of an urban development action area project for such properties and an exemption from real property taxes for the project area. These actions will facilitate a mixed-use development containing approximately 52 affordable housing units in Council Member Perkins District in Manhattan. The Council Member is in support of these actions. We will also vote on the proposed borough-based jail system. We have arrived here this morning as a result of years and years of hard work and advocacy. What we are voting on this morning is so meaningful to so many people because it is based on the hope that if we treat people fairly, respect their humanity through public policy changes, many of the lives that would have otherwise been lost to hopelessness and harm may now have brand new opportunities to succeed. Those fortunate enough to have never experienced our criminal justice system or lived in a community without the basic resources that many of us take for granted may have a harder time understanding why closing Rikers Island and investing in eliminating the root causes of incarceration are so very important. Many of us think it could never happen to us, that we could never find ourselves in a situation where we're accused of a crime, that those who are accused of crimes aren't us, they're different from us, so we can't relate and don't understand what all the fuss is about. But there is both an arrogance to this kind of thinking and certainly a lack of compassion. We must all understand that if our circumstances were just a little different, we too could be in the shoes of the New Yorkers sitting in Rikers right now, scared, hopeless, searching for security, and being forever changed as a result. We need to find the compassion to invest in programs that will pre prevent incarceration in the first place helping people with mental illness, interrupting anger and subsequent violence, giving people a home and stable life on which to build resiliency and better cope with trauma. And if they do in fact slip onto the other side of our laws, we are there too to catch them and get them back on their feet the way that some of us have, the way that we would with our very own children. We vote today on a plan to close Rikers Island and the existing detention centers in Manhattan, 
Brooklyn and the Bronx because history has shown us that these are places our sons and daughters have experienced despair and hopelessness, violence and suffering. Through an agreement reached with the administration, we are not only building more humane jail facilities, but we are also going to invest in programs and policies that prevent incarceration, provide alternative to detention, and help people who are detained find their footing again. Responding to the advocacy of dedicated criminal justice stakeholders, many of whom themselves experienced the harsh conditions of Rikers Island, the council has secured a total of $469,895,000 in commitments for criminal justice-related programming and community-based investments. These commitments consist of $158 million that is already budgeted, $189 million in new expense funding, and a $122.4 million for new capital projects, ranging from affordable housing for the justice involved to mental health programs and new community centers for our young people. We believe that in securing this broad set of commitments, the council sends a strong message that we understand our new approach must go beyond new jail buildings. We have also heard local community feedback loud and clear, concerns about the scale of these new buildings and their impact on the surrounding communities. The council has aggressively advocated for design changes. And as a result of the council's modifications, the heights and densities of the four buildings are being reduced significantly. So these new buildings will better integrate into their communities. We had a, have a lot of people to thank for getting us to this point. First, I'd like to thank council members Diana Ayala, Margaret Chin, Karen Koslowitz, and Steve Levin. They have fought hard for the needs of their communities and balanced them with the criminal justice goals of this plan, which was not an easy thing to do. This was probably the hardest fight of their careers at city council. I know this project has generated a lot of emotional feedback from constituents, but these four members have been steady and strong for their review of this project and advocacy for what they believed was important. I'd also like to thank City Council Speaker Corey Johnson for his staunch, careful leadership throughout this entire project. There are many voices and needs to consider in a project of this scale and importance, but being bold in a moment like this takes strength and courage, and our speaker was determined not to settle for anything less than what this moment demanded. But our most sincere thanks and gratitude is reserved for all of the formerly incarcerated individuals. Why, please. These individuals have pushed us to not only invest in new buildings, but invest in new opportunities because they knew, you knew firsthand how powerful redemption can be, and they want a clearer path to redemption for their brothers and sisters in the future. It is our hope now that communities can begin to heal because we've invested in the right places, because we've, we're treating people with the dignity they deserve. I now recognize Council Member Levin for remarks. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would just like to associate myself with, with your remarks and for uh, your leadership uh, on this subcommittee, um, which has been absolutely steadfast. Um, I want to um, thank all of you for your forbearance this morning and um, um, working with us uh, to get to this point uh, this morning. I wanna, I wanna acknowledge um, all of the justice uh, impacted people and communities that we've been working with um, for many months now 
uh, to arrive at this point. Um, the Close Rikers campaign, which um, called our city to its to its uh, its conscience and um, made us recognize as a society that we have the ability to choose our own future. And um, if it seems impossible, um, persevere and have faith in, in ourselves and our ability to change the world um, as we would like to see it. And um, the Close Rikers campaign was told that it was too ambitious or it would never happen. Um, and that was only a few short years ago. And, um, and here we are uh, at the precipice of, of really changing, um, changing how we want to approach community justice. Community justice, not criminal justice, community justice. Um, and, and so I wanna thank I want to thank the Close Rikers campaign and Beyond Rosies um, for, for sticking with this vision, for sticking with this vision. Um, I want to thank um, the members of the downtown Brooklyn Borum Hill community um, that came together in good faith, part of the Neighborhood Advisory Committee, and um, put a priority on seeing what we could do as a city to do reforms, bail reform and uh, speedy trial reform and discovery reform, but also how we can invest in communities, as the chair said, um, to, make, to make sure that people never come in contact with incarceration or with, with police. And, and we've, we've taken that charge very seriously and, and, and made that a priority. And so I want to thank, I want to thank this community. Um, I see Justin is here and Sandy is here who have, have been uh, really committed to, to making sure that that happens and, and, and also making sure that any jail building in downtown Brooklyn is, is within context of the rest of the neighborhood and is seen as not something that is uh, just an outlier or um, an institution, but is, is, is going to be part of, of the neighborhood. Um, and that's important moving forward. Um, I wanna thank obviously the speaker, Corey Johnson, and, uh, and his chief of staff, Jason Goldman, our land use director, Raju Mann, um, uh, the staff that worked on this, uh, Brian Crow, Alana Sivan, um, George, and I'm sorry, George, I'm gonna miss, I, how do I pronounce George's last name? Sarkissian, um, and um, uh, and uh, and and, the, and Lillian Pascone um, uh, as well for all of their uh, their work on this. And and I want to thank the administration. I see Dana Kaplan here, um, the entire Mock J team and uh, intergovernmental affairs team. Who um, to hear more? Uh, who I talked with countless late hours on this. So. Um, I'll reserve further comments uh, for, the, for the full council vote, but I just wanna thank all of you for your commitment here and for daring to, to dream big and, and, take, um, and take charge of our future and say um, that we're not going to allow history to judge us passively by allowing a place like Riker Island Rikers Island to just perpetuate on into the future. We have the ability to close it, and we have the ability to close it now. Um, and lastly, I do want to thank uh, everyone that was part of the No New Jails movement because they um, they really made uh, us do better and uh, and made us think about what it means uh, to uh, to decarcerate and what it means to really think about jail and prison abolition in the long term. And um, I think this is a plan, uh, a meaningful step on the way towards dismantling um, what is an unjust 
system for far too long for far too many people. Um, and, uh, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Levin. I'd like to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Rory Lansman. I recognize Council Member Koselowitz. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your remarks. <clears throat> I'm not going to make a big speech. Tomorrow I will talk, but today starts a happy day in my life. I've been a council member for over 20 years, 10 years from the 90s, and then now 10 years again. This has been the hardest issue I have ever worked on. The hardest. From day one, I could tell you now, I will be voting yes on this tomorrow with, with stars and stripes and everything. That's how important this is to me. And I just want to thank all the people that have been helping us on this issue because it was not an easy issue. There were people in my community that I've worked very hard for for many years that are angry with me because I am voting yes on this. But I feel that I am doing the right thing, the most humane thing that I can possibly do. I visited Rikers Island in the 90s. I've also visited the jail in Kew Gardens. They're not cells, they're, they're cages. And people don't belong in cages. They belong in a society that wants to help them. And in this situation, they are going to be helped. I want to thank the Land Use Committee for all the help and questions that I had to ask you. I want to thank my colleagues who have been in this situation through the whole time talking and, and assuring each other because some days were very, very hard when people were your friends and now they're not your friends. But I feel very strongly about this. And I just want to thank the speaker for being there for us and Jason Goldman for being there for the hours that we would talk on the phone and it wasn't just during the day, it was at night. It was a very hard process. I'll make my big speech tomorrow, but I just want to let you know this is <clears throat> a start of a happy time for me. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Chin has a prior engagement and is not able to be here this morning, but she did ask me to read her remarks on her behalf. And it says, thank you, Chair Adams, for taking a moment to read my comments to the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Sightings, and Dispositions about the application to create four borough-based jails. Rikers Island is representative of a criminal justice system that has trapped marginalized communities, including low-income New Yorkers of color, in a decades-long cycle of incarceration. From the beginning, I have been clear that Rikers must go if we are going to truly reform and reimagine how New York City's criminal justice system operates. That fundamental commitment that so many of us here share has prompted a tough but critical dialogue about the proposed borough-based jail plan. Part of that dialogue has included addressing legitimate concerns raised by myself and my constituents about the proposed jail at 124-125 White Street as well as securing community investments for Chinatown. From the beginning, I made clear my intention to secure a serious reduction in the bulk and height of the proposed jail. Working with residents, I secured a significant height reduction from 450 feet to 295 feet. This 155-foot drop ensures that the proposed jail will not be out of scale with the neighborhood. As chair of the Committee on Aging, I am deeply committed to our city seniors, and as a result, I demanded construction mitigation and a preservation plan of the senior residents at the Chung Pak building located next to the Manhattan Detention Center. Mm -hmm. 
Upgrading community spaces was another priority. We secured close to $10 million in capital investments to upgrade Columbus Park, including a comfort station upgrade and pavilion renovation. Finally, we ensured the creation of a brand new cultural performing arts center at 215 Center Street, which will serve as a vital resource center for the entire Chinatown community. I want to thank Chair Adams and members of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Sightings and Dispositions for their consideration of this item. I also want to thank the Subcommittee staff, Raju Mann, Jeff Ewan, the Mayor's Office, and HPD. I recognize Councilmember Ayala for remarks. Thank you. Let me remove my glasses so that I can see. Good morning, everyone. I'm Councilmember Diana Ayala, representative of East Harlem and the South Bronx, and the chair of the Council's Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. Before I begin, I want to thank Councilmember Adrian Adams and my colleagues on the Subcommittee of Landmarks, Public Sittings, and Dispositions for proceeding over this critical vote. The borough-based jail plan affords our city a historic opportunity to reimagine our criminal justice system. Rikers Island is antiquated, unsafe, and inhumane, and redefining our criminal justice system demands its closure. The new facilities proposed by this plan will be equipped with adequate space for educational programming, therapeutic services, and other elements to help justice-involved people successfully re-enter their communities. Additionally, because the facilities will be community-based, incarcerated individuals will have greater access to their family, friends, attorneys, and overall support system. With reduced heights, and projected jail populations of 3,300 by 2026, the borough-based jail plan will shrink the city's carceral footprint and put us on a path to decarceration. We have also identified a mechanism to ensure that the closure of Rikers, Rikers Island by 2026, demonstrating that we have never been interested in expanding our jail system. Never, ever. Since day one, our goal has been to minimize it, and that is exactly what this plan will do. Since the initial announcement in February 2018, I have stressed the importance of holistic community investments for the South Bronx, a neighborhood historically neglected by all levels of government. My staff and I have met with local youth groups, seniors, public housing residents, community board members, clergy leaders, social service providers, and justice-involved people by, to cultivate community investment plan reflective of their needs. I am proud to stand here today and share that their vision will be brought to fruition with millions of dollars earmarked by this administration for various investments. Those include a new youth hub for Mott Haven, renovations for four NYCHA community centers, a new community center in Highbridge, an expansion of Cure Violence program, capital improvements for our schools and public housing developments, new cornerstone programs, a senior center for Millbrook residents, plus the development of deeply affordable housing on two public sites. The South Bronx has been detrimentally impacted by decades of disinvestment, and that is why, since the beginning, I have fought alongside my community for those investments that will help dismantle drivers of mass incarceration, such as the school-to-prison pipeline. At the new youth hub, for example, Bronx youth will have access to primary care, mental health services, vocational training, academic enrichment, and more. This, coupled with our enhanced community centers and investment in the Cure Violence Program, will help drive down arrest numbers and divert youth away from justice involvement. Our community investment package is closely aligned with the leadership build communities uh, with just leadership build communities platform which recognizes that a well resourced environment is key to maximizing safety and ensuring high health educational and employment outcomes i thank all of the advocates and directly impacted leaders who have fiercely fought for this plan if not for you we would not be here today Thank you for pushing us to embark on this moral imperative and redefine a system that has harmed black and brown communities for far too long. As some may know, my younger brother was in and out of prison for almost two decades. His repeated encounters with current criminal justice system have contributed to a decline in his social, emotional, and mental well-being. His story is the story of countless of other formerly incarcerated people, and it drives my commitment to this plan. Because of him, I dare to replace our current system with one that is holistic, responsive, and most importantly, humane. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Ayala. We recognize Councilmember Barron. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all of my colleagues and to all of those who are here on this particularly um, complex issue. 
First, I want to say that a part of the uh, vote that we'll be taking today is a bill about my district, LU 545, and it's an infill project for home ownership. And it's nine two-family homes and four three-family homes, and it's geared for people whose AMI is from 80 to 100% of the AMI. So I want to put that on the record, and I want to say we can build affordable housing so that people can be involved in those kinds of conditions. Historically, the penitentiary system uh, was instituted at the end of chattel slavery in America. And it was a system that was devised to continue a source of free labor, which is how we got the convict leasing system. So the penitentiary system as it exists is in fact designed to do just that, continue free or cheap labor for the capitalistic interests of the United States. Someone last week referred to the justice system and said it's not broken because it's doing what it was intended to do, provide cheap labor. I think that the problems are many, but it's uh, inappropriate detention and the poor who are mainly black and Latino are the ones who are detained. Those who have money can in fact post bail. And we know that we have many reforms that are being instituted and that's a good thing. But there's still the subjectivity of judicial discretion. And we still have judges who have the ability to determine whether someone who is black or brown will be able to, will be detained as opposed to someone who is white who will not be detained. And the statistics bear that out. That still exists. So we have insufficient and inadequate interventions. And I think that all of those things that we're talking about that are needed to be a part of what needs to be uh, included in making this a more humane system should already have been in place and should already be implemented in a way that we can know that it's not just lip service that we're saying that this is what we're going to do. That same dollar amount that we're talking about to go to crisis intervention and to go to community-based organizations can in fact be designed to be the form in which those persons who will no longer be detained will be able to have those services. So that those groups that exist presently and have proven to be effective can in fact be the place where people who are uh, subject to going back to court can complete their time, can get training, and can get those services that we need. Why don't we invest in beautiful accommodations affordable to everyone not just when they're going to jail to make it beautiful, make it pleasant, make it inviting. We can do those same things on an intervention basis, not confined to a jail, but in, included in a larger society. So I think that the challenge and the change of the racial discrimination is the basis for what will make the difference in these systems. And for that reason, I will be voting no on citing new borough-based jails. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. The borough-based jail system is comprised of 13 related items, pre-considered LUs 513 through 516 and LUs 518 through 526. They include a zoning text amendment creating a citywide special permit for borough-based jails facilities, a site selection application for borough-based jail facilities in Manhattan, the Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn, four special permits, one for each borough-based jail facility, three city map change applications affecting certain streets and public spaces in Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan, an acquisition of property for the Manhattan Borough-based borough -based jail facility, and three actions related to the provision of affordable housing near the Bronx Borough-based jail facility, a zoning text amendment, a zoning map change, and a UDAP area and project designation and disposition. In addition to modifying the four special permits, we will also be modifying pre-considered LU 515 to strike MIH option two and will add the deep affordability option to MIH option one. I now call for a vote to approve LU numbers 545 through 547, the pre-considered LU for HPD application number 20205116 HAM, and to approve with the modifications I have described, pre-considered LUs 513 through 516 and LUs 518 through 526. Council, please call the roll. Council Member Adams. Aye. 
Councilmember Barron. I vote aye on all with the exception of land use 513 through 516 and 518 through 526. Councilmember Ku. Can I explain my vote? Yes. Yeah. Um, today's vote is one of the most important votes I made um, in the city council. I think uh, closing Wagas Island is the right thing to do. Wagas Island is too old. Uh, it cannot, uh, it's beyond repair. So um, it's the humane thing we can do uh, to close Wagas Island. And then moving the jail system near the cone is the right thing to do. It's, it saves a lot of uh, time, uh, energy for the person, uh, personnel to transport the inmates. So uh, we also have to be more compassionate uh, to the inmates, to their families. Imagine you are grandparents you, or your parent and your son or your grandson is in trouble, uh, you would, if, if you have to visit them in Wikis Island, it will take you a long time. You, know, you have to get up early in the morning, spend a lot of time uh, just to visit them. So with the change of the new, um, new uh, jail, uh, it's, it's easier uh, for families to visit uh, their relatives or their children and it's, give them a better chance to rehab, rehabit, uh, rehabilitate. And we want to, uh, we don't want to, uh, we want to help inmates because, uh, so that they become uh, productive citizens again. So with all that said, uh, I will uh, yes on all the bills mentioned. Thank you. Councilmember Miller. Permission to explain my vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. So it, it is abundantly clear here today that, that many had suffered uh, the inhumanities of what is known as Rikers Island over decades. Um, this includes everyone, including workforce. It is also clear from the dialogue that has occurred over the past three years that, that this is a necessary first step. And while it is a necessary first step, let's recognize that closing Rikers Island is the lowest of the bar when it comes to criminal justice reform, which absolutely has to happen. Brick and mortars does not circumvent the draconian and racist policies that have disproportionately incarcerated black and brown people. I am glad to see that the prevailing wisdom of, of true criminal justice reform has come to the forefront and that um, by virtue of negotiations, uh, I want to thank uh, the leadership here, um, the speaker and others, um, that, that the prevailing wisdom of a more just criminal justice system um, uh, has prevailed and, and that we have chosen policies and service and, and, and programming over uh, incarceration. Um, but again, and that is, let me just say, that is by virtue of, of the voices of everybody that is in this room. It has been said time and time again that folks thought that this was an impossibility. While I am not convinced that this is the end all I know that this is a necessary first step, and I am also, I also know that if not for the advocacy, we wouldn't be here, right? This is a voice that nobody wanted to hear, that people wanted this voice to just go away. But the fact of the matter is that there, there are many of us that are impacted every day, not just constituency, family members, sons and daughters and neighbors and selves that have been impacted by this unjust criminal justice system. And we have an opportunity uh, to really do something about it. 
and because of everybody that is out here and these advocates and the courage of my colleagues that we are doing something about it. Even beyond closing Rikers Island, this is not the end of this conversation. We don't go away when Rikers Island is closed because there's much more work to be done. Uh, I vote aye on all. Council Member Traeger. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. I, like many of my colleagues, feel keenly the historical weight of the actions which are before us today. Uh, over uh, two years ago, many of us committed to the urgency of closing Rikers, which is plagued by violence and isolation, limits the ability of incarcerated people to maintain contact with their families and communities, and keeps the conditions and impacts of incarceration outside of the public eye. I will be voting yes today because, simply put, I feel that this vote is necessary to close Rikers. Make no mistake, this plan is not sufficient to fully achieve justice for communities impacted by mass incarceration. But for me, to vote no would give credence to the prevailing sentiment from just a few years ago that closing Rikers was overly idealistic and impossible. There will not be another opportunity to vote to close Rikers in the near future. I do not have confidence that there is the political and bureaucratic will to close Rikers outside of this vote. This is the day of decision. We have the opportunity to reaffirm the commitment to the moral exigency, exigency of closing Rikers and continue the historic arc of the criminal justice reform work on the city and state level such as investing in public health approaches to public safety, decriminalizing quality of life offenses, bail reform, investing in alternatives to incarceration and diversion programs, disrupting and ending, dismantling school to prison pipeline by putting an end to the Giuliani era memorandum of understanding between DOE and NYPD, all of which continue to reduce the number of lives, families, and communities disrupted by incarceration. But there is much more wor work for us to do. I respect the voices of my colleagues, like Councilmember Barron, who have always talked the talk and walked the walk when it comes to criminal justice reform and reinvesting in communities who do not support the creation of borough-based jails. Regardless of the outcome of this vote, I will continue to stand with my colleagues to fight for the resources which we know sustain and uplift our communities. Access to bridge employment programs and adult education, affordable and supportive housing, culturally competent community-based mental health support, high quality schools, re-entry programming, and community-based approaches to public safety. I believe that this plan is a necessary framework for closing Rikers but it is incumbent on us all to commit to holding this administration, future administrations, and the Department of Corrections accountable for their policies and for us to ensure that our priorities as a council are aligned towards justice. And with that, I vote aye. By a vote of five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, with zero abstentions, LU numbers 545 through 547, the pre-considered LU for HPD application number 2025116 HAM, and by a vote of four in the affirmative, one in the negative, and zero abstentions, pre-considered LUs 513 through 516 and LUs 518 through 526 are recommended for referral to the full land use committee. Thank you. Uh, I thank all of my colleagues for being here today. I thank uh, members of the audience for being here today. Uh, just one final note from myself. You know, we've taken a lot of votes in, in council as of late that have been extremely personal for me. And this one in particular was perhaps the most personal. Having a child that has gone through the system could have been a lot worse but also on the other side of the coin, being raised by a correction officer. So having lived the life of a child whose mother very proudly, I might add, retired as, an, as, a, as a captain from the Department of Corrections and worked in Rikers Island for many, many years. I was a latchkey kid under her leadership and guidance. 
So you're looking at a product of a CEO, a proud product of a CEO who when I told her mom, we're going to be talking about Rikers and closing Rikers, she said, baby, they should have closed it a long time ago. <laughs> and so I share that just to put a period on the end of this sentence, at least for this subcommittee today as we conclude, and just letting you know that it is, it is a two-way street at Rikers Island. It is a one-way street for detainees, and it is another street for the CEOs who suffer as well because of the culture that has been ingrained in Rikers Island and the spirit and the walls of Rikers Island. And so I sit here before you to champion the closure immediately, the reform immediately, the mindset change immediately, and the movement to do something radically different in the ways of criminal reform. I'd like to thank all of you for being here today, especially land use staff members, Raju Mann, George Sarkissian, Council, Amy Levitan, Jeff Campania, all of my colleagues for being here, Council members Ayala, Koslowitz, Chin, Levin, all of the members of the subcommittee that sit here today, thank you all for your resilience. This meeting is hereby adjourned.